of what it is you're trying to achieve and where you want to go. You must have leadership that articulates and projects that vision. In other words, there's got to be a face on it. Doesn't have to be the only face, but there's got to be a face. Dr. King was the face of the civil rights movement. Was he the only face? No. That was Hubert Newton, Angela Davis, H. Ralph Brown, Stokely Carmichael. Uh, that was James Foreman. That was Whitney Young. That was, I mean, that, that, that was at Malcolm X. That were, but they put, Carlos. Yeah, yeah. They put a face on it. The uh, next thing you've got to have is a method. You've got to have a method that promises to move this vision that is so well articulated up the road. And then the fourth thing you've got to have is some measure by which those impacted can define progress. If someone not impacted is defining progress, you don't know whether it's accurate or not. So there's got to be something by those impacted, targeted, the central focus of the movement that enables you to judge we have made progress. Without those four things, you don't have a movement. Without those four things, you don't have leadership. Without those four things, you just have a bunch of people who are out for a walk. And they'll walk from here to there and up there and someplace and cause a lot of what, we, what they gonna do, where are they gonna go, but in the end, you don't have a movement. This is where I see the Occupy movement at, at this stage. One of the things that bothers me about the Occupy movement is that it was not those who were left out and left behind most severely who sparked the Occupy movement. It was not what is happening in the inner cities. It, is, it was not what was happening to poor whites. It was not what was happening in the barrios of East LA. It was not what was happening with the uh, uh, drug uh, culture and the war on drugs that has resulted in American society jailing a higher proportion and a greater number of its citizens than any other nation on the face of this earth, even China, in terms of number and proportion. And China has six times the population. That's something wrong with that. That was not what provoked the Occupy movement. What provoked the Occupy movement was all of a sudden you had college students who are supposedly the elite home free. All they got to do is get their degree and they move right into Wall Street and start making their money and cutting their deals and so forth. All of a sudden they found themselves unable to make the tuition and unable to pay the loans that they had taken out to pay the tuition. All of a sudden you found people in Lafayette, Walnut Creek and Concord, Fremont, Los Altos Hills, Palo Alto, losing their homes. They looked up out in Tracy where they had moved because gas they could afford to commute to San Francisco cheaper than they could afford to live in San Francisco and pay to garage their car. They moved out to Tracy, they moved out to Stockton, and all of a sudden they find themselves out of work, out of house, and out of gas. And at that point they began to question the validity, the viability, the actual capacity of the traditional American dream to meet their needs. It was out of that situation that the Occupy movement emerged. The problem with that is that it's not a broad enough vision. It's like James Baldwin stated in 1963 when he wrote a book that is now a prophetic classic, The Fire Next Time. He talked about the Civil Rights Movement and the fact that the Civil Rights Movement was a middle class oriented, middle class led, middle class inspired movement. The first person to refuse to sit down on a bus was not Rosa Parks, even though she's known as the mother of the Civil Rights Movement. 
It was a young lady who was a high school dropout, 16 years old, and seven months pregnant. And somebody, a white man, walked up and told her to get up out of that seat because she was sitting in the wrong section. She said, sir, I'm pregnant, I'm tired, and I've still got three and a half miles before I get off this bus. I can't stand up for three and a half miles. The bus driver came back and snatched her out the seat, and she came up cussing and swinging. And the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which picked up very quickly on Rosa Parks' case, this middle class secretary of the NAACP, nice and sweet as you could be, picked up on her case, would not touch the case of this young ex-student, this high school dropout, because it was not, quote, the kind of case we want to stand on. But she was the first to refuse to stand up. So just as the middle class, the middle class dominated the movement for civil rights, and it's reflected in what they finally settled for. The middle class got uh, affirmative action. The people from the class that this young girl came from got programs. The middle class got open housing. If you could afford to come up with a $50,000 down payment, you could move into Concord or Walnut Creek or Lafayette or Fremont or Palo Alto. If you couldn't come up with that, then you didn't get open housing. You got public housing. You got projects. And looking at all of that, James Baldwin wrote this book, The Fire Next Town. He said, we must dare to include everybody if we're going to make progress as a society, if we're going to live up to our promise as a nation. And he said, to the extent that we do not, we leave massive numbers, increasing numbers, of people behind who are left out and left behind. And it is only a matter of time before they step up and make it very, very clear that what has been achieved and accomplished is not good enough. Dr. King began to recognize that. That's why when he was assassinated, he wasn't pushing for civil rights. He was pushing for economic rights. He was fighting for those people who had been left behind, left behind to get adequate wages, benefits, and so forth. He recognized what the deal was, but this was in 1968. In 1963, James Baldwin wrote The Fire Next Time, and the concluding paragraph was a quote from an old Negro gospel. And God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water. The fire next time. And what he was pointing out was that the days were gone with those left out and left behind when we would settle for a civil rights movement where black people were washed up and down the street with fire hoses. That the next time there would be fire. And sure enough, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed by Lyndon Johnson. In 1965, June of 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed by Lyndon Johnson. In August of 1965, Watts exploded and brought to fruition the very thing that James Baldwin had warned against the fire next time. When I look at what inspired the Occupy movement, when I look at the fact that they cannot settle upon a vision that is inclusive, they are not willing to dare everything. When I look at where they are, I don't see a movement that is going to generate what is needed if American society is going to get back on 
back on track. Uh, so my perception of the Occupy movement at this point is that it is not a movement. It is a mass in search of a vision, in search of a voice, in search of a method, in search of a structure of evaluation targeting basic fundamental needs of the masses of people, not just those who are middle class and who are falling, but everybody, including, it should include everybody. And this is what the discussion is about in that mass. You see some of everybody represented out there, but where is the vision that brings it all together? Well, is it not, you, you, is there not an intellectual fire hose now being cast? Uh, today you, you come to Palo Alto High School, the day that the Supreme Court has decided to accept the, uh, the, the test case out of Texas that has the potential for gutting affirmative action in all higher education. I wondered if that is not another intellectual fire hose being thrown at, at, at various uh, communities. That, could you come on, on the court and on this particular uh, stream? Affirmative action, when it was initiated, was basically a stopgap. The, 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 the thing that we should all be struggling for is the opportunity for this nation to take full advantage of the creative energies, the intellectual capabilities, the contributory capacities of all sectors of society. It shouldn't just be African Americans in music and athletics. You know, it, it should be that, that full spectrum of creative potential that all groups have the potential to exhibit and develop. That should be the system that we are attempting to bring about. When you say affirmative action, it means, okay, we have our list of admittees to University of California at Berkeley. But geez, we looked and saw where we were 17 and a half Latinos short. So let's go and see who are the top Latinos, irrespective of what that top might actually mean. And let's, let's, let's bring them in under affirmative action for the purposes of diversity. At best, that's a stopgap because there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Latinos in this country, young people who are born, who come here with everything that anybody else comes here with. What they need is support, a vision, inspiration, a chance. That's what we should be shooting for. When you say, we're not going to do anything to open that potentiality up. But we're going to remove even this narrow route that's available. What you're really saying is that we're going to consign greater and greater numbers of people to the dustbin of society. And when they blow up, when they explode, then we're going to feed them in to the prison culture, which is nothing but 21st century slavery. Um, that's the danger that we have here. It's not that affirmative action was the answer and we should fight for it because it was the answer. It, we should fight for it because lacking that broad scale access to opportunity and achievement space, it is a fallback position that at least keeps people in positions to speak to the broader reality and the necessary imperative of broadening the basis of democratic participation in American society if we are to survive and function as a democracy. Otherwise, we're going to be in a situation 
where greater and greater numbers of people are jailed, warehoused, uh, locked up under the pretense of protecting those and their interests uh, who are not yet locked up. Uh, so um, uh, my, my, my whole um, concern about the affirmative action thing is not so much the action itself, but what that action means in that broader context. In, in, in the broader political context of, of being an election year, I wondered if you'd comment on your perception of how the, uh, the, the, the Republicans are doing their choosing, and also a little bit about President Obama and whether you are pleased with his presidency, whether you, uh, uh, whether you are criticism, uh, critical of his presidency. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, for those uh, who, I think that a head nod and a shake back and forth. If someone had told me in 1960, when I first came to college, that I would live to see an African American family in the White House, my response would have been, especially during that time, the 1960s give me a couple of pounds of whatever you smoking, because it's got to be some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, not unrealistic. Uh, it, was, it was utterly unrealistic. I think that given... Shirley Chisholm, was no, there was no way, right? Uh, Shirley Chisholm did not even have the support of the Congressional Black Caucus. <laughs> One, she was a woman, which was her biggest obstacle, not race. And two, the people who had been elected to office continue to think of themselves as basically minions of the white power structure. And the better they were at being minions, the better they would uh, fare in terms of whatever that white power structure <coughs> had to hand out. Uh, Barack Obama, stepped forward and declared his candidacy. And most people took it as another Shirley Chisholm, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Dick Gregory, uh, Eldridge Cleaver presidential run. <laughs> most of these people don't know who those names are, but you, you can explain to them yeah. later. Um, <laughs> Making me work. But the reality is that his candidacy was legitimate, his vision was clear, and his organizational capability and competence was absolutely flawless. Today, people tend to be upset with Barack Obama because, as some of his most severe critics have stated, he has not picked up the mantle of Dr. King and uh, pursued the economic um, democracy at the bottom that Dr. King died in pursuit of. And I've made the point many, many times that I did not vote for Dr. King. I voted in the spirit of Dr. King that, and in the hope that the rest of the electorate would look at Barack Obama and judge him not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character and the caliber of his competence. And on that basis, from the day he declared, I believed that he had a chance, slim chance, but he had a chance. Once he was in, I think many political interests demonstrated to a T that character and competence is meaningless to them against the undeniable reality of race. From the day that he took the oath of office, there were those who stood up and publicly said, "Our." One aim and only goal is to make sure that he's a one-term president. 
and everything that he has tried to do along the way, even when he was, even when he has um, offered up their policies, their suggested programs and projects, they have voted no because their goal is not to serve America. Their goal is not to meet the needs of this country in one of the most uh, crisis-ridden eras since the Great Depression. Their goal is to make sure that he's a one-term president. And what makes it even more ludicrous to me, and this is, I'm, and, and I'm just speaking here, is that the candidates that they have put forward are a joke. The Republican <laughs> Party has descended into a clown car. You know one of them little cars that roll up into the spotlight at the circus and clowns just come tumbling out of just about the time you think that couldn't possibly be any more clowns in that car? Three to four more clowns. <laughs> clowns with comb overs. Overweight clowns. Clowns talking gibberish. Clowns uh, offering up pizzas and <laughs> one night stands, uh, and this is the, this is this is who they're saying is the legitimate opposition that the American public should vote in because, in their way of thinking, it doesn't matter how uh, obtuse, degenerate, uh, duplicitous, hypocritical, flip-floppy, or whatever else <laughs> the opposition is, as long as that black family is not in the White House in 2013. Um, is, it, is this why you, uh, you see so many uh, restrictions on African American voting rights uh, coming out of state after state oh, after I don't state. Think, I don't think there's that. We have returned in many ways to the poll tax, grandfather clauses. Um, you know, here's somebody who is 93 years old, has been voting, has never missed a turn at voting since the voting rights bill was established. And in Virginia or somewhere, and she has to come up with a birth certificate, two pieces of ID, one of them with a photo. This is this this is this is nothing but a way of restricting people's right to vote. Students, your student ID card with your photo and showing that you are legitimately enrolled in a major university, have paid your tuition, have a residence on campus, that's not good enough. You've got to have a state-issued ID card in order to vote in that state, even though you may have come from 3,000 miles away. You can't cast a vote in that state where you are a resident, where you live. And any time you live someplace nine months out of the year, hey, that's where you live. Don't tell me nothing about my room at my mom and daddy's house, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> back, back, back in Virginia. Uh, th 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 this is, this is, these are nothing but efforts to restrict that population, which looks at this situation and says, I don't have any problem with gays serving in the military. I don't have any problem with uh, extending unemployment insurance to families who are vitally dependent on it. Not to put gas in their Cadillac, but to eat, to clothe children, to buy diapers, to keep the heat in the water running, uh, uh, the, the electricity in the water running. Uh, they are trying to restrict those people who say the car industry in Detroit is worth saving. And at some point, and, 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 and you know, this, this, is, this is another thing that, that, that kind of gets me. We got in the street with the Occupy thing. A lot of different interests out there, a lot of different people out there for all kinds of reasons. 
But when people were, you know, I, I went down to a healthcare thing because I think that there's something immoral, not just unsettling or wrong, there's something fundamentally immoral about being the richest country on the face of this earth and 40% of the people don't have health insurance. I'm 70 years old. I know what it means when you need health insurance. Because every day I get up, it's something else. I got up this morning, the time I shoot, and all of a sudden I look at, what the hell is this, you know? I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that, that happens. So I know what it means not to have health insurance, but, but I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I was smarter than everybody else. I chose the right parents. And so I can, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in better health than, than people a lot of times have my age. But I think there's something fundamentally immoral about not, about having 40% of the people in this country without health insurance. And so I went down to the health care hearings, town hall meetings. Five minutes after the meeting opened, I felt like, George C. cussed at the little bit hard. <laughs> Outnumbered, surrounded, and under attack because the rest of the people, we don't want our money back. We, if you can't afford health care, then you should die. What you been doing? And, and I, I mean, I couldn't believe Where were the people who, who were saying, young people who are still in school and can't afford the uh, loan shark premiums for decent health care should be able to still be on their mom and dad's health care uh, through work until they're 26. Where, where are those people? We, we, we voted in Barack Obama. Then we left it to him. We went home and we went to sleep. We snoozed through the health care debate. We snored through the uh, debt ceiling <coughs> debate. We uh, uh, run it and snort it through uh, the uh, debate over whether gay citizens should be able to put their lives on the line to defend this country. The other side in the street and we count sheep. But, but you know, <laughs> I think that people will do whatever they have to do to survive. I mean, even Rip Van Winkle eventually woke up. <laughs> and I think that as we move forward with the struggle and people become, begin more and more to understand what's at stake, why it's important that we not have somebody out there talking gibberish, uh, somebody who on so many different sides of issues that they need to call a meeting and ask for equal time to answer themselves. <laughs> that, that we don't need that in, in the federal government. What we need now is compassion. We need leadership. We need people who understand that there's something fundamentally immoral about a woman not being in control of her own body. Something wrong with that. And 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 you know I um, I don't know anybody who advocates abortion. I don't know a single soul that advocates abortion. And we get it all twisted around and turned around. People who say oftentimes that they're pro-life, they, they haven't thought it through. They're not pro-life, they're pro-birth. Because in every single society where women have been compelled and forced to have babies that they did not want or could not afford or were in some way detrimental to their health, a situation they tried to abort that pregnancy. And the record also shows that where you have those kinds of efforts which are not 
clinical and clean and available and hospital centered and clinic centered and so forth. In a substantial majority of those cases, you end up losing both the baby and the woman. If you're pro-life, there's nothing perhaps that we can do about halting with pregnancy, although this thing over contraception that's going on now where they're fighting, where we, we don't want con contra we're against contraception. They're pro-birth. There's nothing that we can do perhaps about the pregnancy. But if we're going to be pro-life, let's opt on the side of life. I don't know anyone who is pro-abortion, but where women will do what they feel they have to do, let's at least try to save the life of the woman. And that makes me, in my definition of the situation, pro-life as opposed to just pro-birth. If people disagree with that, then my position, since I'm not saying you're forced to do this, is that's fine. Have the baby. I'm good with that. My mother had the baby. Here was a I come from a family. My mother was virtually illiterate. My father was an ex-convict who literally went into bad health trying to prove that a black man with a criminal record could raise a wife, raise a family, a wife and eight children on $65 a week and still stay honest. They had eight children. And through it all, my mother and my father decided to have the children. And so I'm here to speak to you today for that reason. I'm not pro-abortion. I don't know anybody who is saying that is pro-abortion. But my definition of pro-life is something that's quite different. That's a different definition than a lot of people out there talking now. And those who are talking, get no con no, we will not support contraception. They don't want to support contraception. They don't want to support a lady who wants to exercise choice. And as soon as the baby is born, they're saying no health insurance, no support for uh, situations of unemployment, cut back on the social programs and broaden the money that we spend, spend on the jails. You know what? That's something fundamentally degenerate about that perspective, philosophy, and organization. Uh, and all the more so since so often it's done in the name of, quote, the religious right. I don't believe that. Let me add, if you change a, 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 a letter from pro-life to pro-love and ask you to comment, if you will, on the furor over gay people who wish to love and marry each other in spite of a society which demonizes them. And uh, I'd also like to know your perspective, if you could, on resistance among uh, church-going members, particularly African-American church-going members, to the idea that gay marriage is acceptable and within in other words, does, where is the, what is trumping what here? Well, let me, let me start, I mean, as one who is a 45-year victim of the institution of marriage. <laughs> uh, my, uh, I've been with the same lady for 45 years. Um, and... 23 over here. If, uh, if um, somebody else 
wants part of this, I'll spot them 20. I give them 20 of that just to get them involved. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, let, let, let's, let, let's, let, let, let's go back to this, this, this thing of the black community and the black church in particular. In 1963, in the March on Washington, there were two things that stood out and were utterly underplayed relative to the racial equality <coughs> angle. The first is, during the main speaking period, no women were allowed to speak. Not Dorothy Haight, uh, uh, the National Organization of Negro Women, N no one. They, they allowed um, Mahalia Jackson to come up and sing a hymn to open that main speaker's session. The second thing was there were two gay people who were critical to the March on Washington. The first was James Baldwin because he was the premier protest writer of the era. He was one of the, he was the first black writer since the era of Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, and Richard Wright, Notes of a Native Son, to really get national play in national literary magazines. And of course, again, his book, The Fire Next Time, was uh, critical. It raised the hackles of a whole lot of uh, black civil rights leaders because it said essentially, hey, you guys are only doing part of the job. The main part of the job is still left, left behind, uh, in, in front of you, and if you don't watch yourself, it's going to blow up in your face, which of course it did. Spawn the Black Power Movement, the Black Panther Party, the US Group, and so forth and so on. But he had also written a number of novels, Giovanni's Room, which was a novel about homosexual lovers. lovers. And he was open, James Baldwin was openly gay. He made no, no bones about it. They would not allow him to speak at the March on Washington. One, because as Malcolm X said, Baldwin might stand up and say anything, like, uh, hey guys, you're wasting your time here with this, because look over here. Um, and the second, but the major reason was have. that he was gay. They didn't want to project the wrong image. The second reason was, and I'm talking about decisions that Dr. King made with A. Philip Randolph and James Foreman and Whitney Young and John Lewis. Right. The, the uh, um, NFL and the CIO unions and Ruther. Yeah, uh, Walter Ruther. These were conscious decisions. The second person that they kept out um, who actually uh, organized the March on Washington, uh, it's old age, boy, I'm telling you, um, was also homosexual. And they would not allow him to speak. And what we had going here as a consequence of the gay people, one, the leading protest writer and voice of black outrage during that period of time, the man who coined the sentiment to be black and aware in America is to be in a constant state of rage. They would not allow him to speak. They would not allow Ben Rustin, who organized the March on Washington, he organized the whole thing to speak. This melding of civil rights and homophobia has taken on the status of theology in the African American community principally because so many preachers were involved in the Civil Rights Movement and the March on Washington, including Dr. King. And so today, you have people who are otherwise progressive, compassionate, understanding, who commit themselves to this outmoded notion that God didn't create Adam and Steve, he created Adam and Eve. And to that, I am totally committed.
committed. And so we have a situation where people in a confused, violent, hate-filled, divided world are only trying to love somebody. And there is nothing, there is nothing that gays do that negatively impacts me. In point of fact, over my 45 years of being married, when I have seen people divorce and break up and so forth because of somebody got another kitchen somewhere or something else, that's never been a gay involved. It's been <laughs> some other heterosexual. So if they're going to start barring people, maybe they should start barring an outlaw, single heterosexual people, or even married heterosexual people, <laughs> since that, you know, that's where most of the breakups come. I can't think of a single thing that two gay people trying to love each other, and that's all they're saying. That I, I love somebody. Or about talking about the um, the short shift or the, the, the okay, now, now my old age is affecting me. Um, that, that we give uh, high school and college athletes um, the the ticket we sell them by saying if you do this your life is set. But really, what it, we end up doing is taking more from them than we. Yeah, I, uh, I have, uh, there were two things that I stated in 1968 that hold to this day. The first question that I raised at a time when there were no black coaches, not even as assistants, no black administrators, no black athletic directors outside of the historically black schools, but you look at an increasing number of African Americans on the basketball court, on the football field, on the track. I raised the issue of why should we play where we can't work? And that was the whole notion behind the boycott, the shutdowns, you know, along with a second factor, which was the total exploitation of the black athlete where these mainstream college institutions, supposedly ethical, rational bastions of the society's integrity, because you're turning out leaders in every area, and what they leave there with is what they take to these new jobs and positions. They were ripping off, systematically ripping off African American athletes. They would go into the black community at recruiting time, pick up a bunch of black athletes, bring them to the campus, use them, exploit them, take up all of their eligibility, and then dump them and go back and pick up another group and tell them the same lies. You come here, you're gonna get your degree, you're gonna get a chance to play professional sports, and you're gonna be on easy street as a result of that big, large contract when the reality was that less than only about 16% of black athletes graduated from the schools that they participated in, where they participated in sports, scholarship athletes in basketball and football, track. And their chances of signing a professional contract was only about 2% in uh, football and about 5% in basketball. That is to say, in excess of 95% of the athletes who come through and play these two sports at that time never showed up on a professional roster. At that time, most of the professional teams had quotas on how many African Americans could be on the team. And the ones that were there were stacked in various positions. I remember in 1969 when Bill Russell became the first black professional coach and somebody asked him, one of the white reporters asked him, well, Bill, you know, I, I know that there's an issue of, about playing blacks in the NBA. What do you think is the right number of blacks to play? And Bill made the statement, um, I don't know what the right number is, 
but I know what the tradition is. You play two at home, three on the road, and five when you get behind. Uh, and and, 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 and <laughs> that was the way, even at those who made it, that's the way it was, that's the way it was uh, this happened. So uh, I made the statement that it's not just up to the colleges and universities to correct the situation. But we as a community have an obligation to make sure that our kids learn to dream with their eyes open. That's something important fact that applies to us all now. A lot of us had dreams of owning our own home, but we weren't dreaming with our eyes open. A lot of us had dreams of having this big high paying job and so, but we weren't dreaming with our eyes open. We, we must learn to dream with our eyes open. This is, this is, um, this is one of the things that, 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 sport, that sport taught us, and it, it came out of the exploitation of the black athlete. And it's very interesting, speaking of Bill Russell, he was asked uh, when um, we put together the Olympic project for human rights and the demonstrations in Mexico City, of course, there's always this effort to turn one black athletic star against any effort to change things. So the reporters, a reporter asked Bill, he said, uh, Bill Russell, you were a captain of the 1956 Olympic team. You, uh, you, you're, you're an Olympic all-star and a great professional. Uh, what do you think about uh, Edwards and the Olympic Project for Human Rights and the demonstrations at Mexico City? Bill looked at him and said, well, I don't know. He said, oh, are, are, that, 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 don't you have a problem with that? Aren't you upset? He said, yeah, I have a problem with it. I didn't think of it first. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was uh, that was that was Bill Russell. But it all goes back to this to this um, to this exploitation factor that you that you talk about. And it has improved some, but the bigger the money has gotten, the more athletes put themselves in a position to make that money, not understanding that you still have to dream with your eyes open. So we have an Allen Iverson who has made over $150 million in his career, who is now bankrupt. They're, they've taken, got lanes on his home, taken possession of his car, so the whole nine cars. And that happens over and over again. I know so many great athletes who have made millions, who are now bankrupt. Uh, because they never learn to dream with their eyes open. That's a, that's a continuing struggle. The, 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 you know, the, 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 I stayed on the poster that I left here for your classroom. That, that the struggle to achieve America, what we could be, is ongoing. The challenges that we face in, the, in that effort to achieve America are dynamic and diverse. The struggle is perpetual, and there are no final victories. And so, just as Jackie Robinson didn't resolve the issue of race and sport, Although a lot of people like, like authority, you know, they, they, they took care of that problem. We can move on now. <laughs> the revolt of the black athlete did not resolve the issue of race and sport. Because situation is dynamic, and it continues to evolve. And just about the time that blacks became conscious, women became conscious. In 1972, before Title IX, there were 26 schools that gave scholarships, mainstream school, not kind of black school, that gave scholarships to women in sports. Today, there are 576 schools that give scholarships to women. And that didn't come about because all of a sudden, these people who thought that, you know, women should be in the kitchen and the bedroom all of a sudden, oh, geez, you know, these people can play basketball. They can run track. Guess what? They can even box. That didn't happen. What happened was that women begin to demand change. Bill Jean King. Uh, they begin to demand change. But no change comes about without a demand. But no demand 
will ever resolve finally any issue. The situation is dynamic and diverse, and there are no final victories. That's why every generation has its responsibilities in terms of achieving America. Uh, the only real sin is not in not finding, developing, arriving at a final victory, winning the war. The sin is not fighting the battles that your generation should fight, and therefore this next generation has not only to fight their battles, but yours too. That's the sin. So um, that, 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 that uh, black athlete exploitation thing continues. But it's 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 a, it, there's a different dynamic and a different guys that's involved. When you look at LSU playing Alabama in a national championship game, and it looks like Ghana playing Nigeria, something should click in your mind. Hey, that's not that's something that's not right with this picture. <laughs> I hate to say, I don't want you to be interrupted by a bell, which is probably going to sound itself in about a minute or so, but I know there are a couple of other questions as a journalist who has a question here. Yeah, yeah sure. So speaking of um, dreaming with our eyes open and you know, race and sports, recently we've all seen the what many have thought impossible, and that was Jeremy Lin, an Asian American, coming to the scene of sports. And in the commentary and much of the popular media at, at the moment, there has been uh, some would say a double standard between the treatment of some races and the treatment of Asian Americans in sports. Most recently, an ESPN commentator saying, calling uh, Lynn and Chink in armor. Yeah. Uh, it, does there exist a double standard between There's African a double Americans? standard. For example, blacks have gotten off lighter saying some things about Jeremy Lynn that a white person could not have gotten off saying about somebody that's black. So to that extent, there's a double standard, but there's no double standard in terms of stupidity. Uh, the, the level of stupidity exhibited by people who look at Jeremy Lin and make those negative comments um, is uh, the same. And from, from my perspective, you know, what, 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 what I was saying earlier to somebody that I, there's a, a, a kid, that there, there's a large uh, Asian American population in my neighborhood. And there's a little kid across the street, every, he got a, he's got a um, um, basketball thing sitting on, his, on the slanted driveway at an angle just about like that. But every day he's out there, he's out there shooting. The day after the Knicks beat the Lakers, I drove up into my cul-de-sac, and there wasn't just this one kid. There were about eight kids out there, including two girls. And uh, so as I drove past to go around the corner and park, I stuck my arm out the window and said, Jeremy Lin, baby, and they just went nuts. You know what I'm For me, that, that, that's what we're about, broadening the basis of democratic participation in American society. And I don't care if Jeremy Lin gets to the playoffs and can't hit his plate with his fork. I don't care if he couldn't run from one end of the court to the other if you gave him all day. We will have this eight games. We will have this episode. It's like Humphrey Bogart told Ingrid Berg Bergman, we'll always have Paris. <laughs> and that's the way I feel about this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a tremendous story. It's a great story. We should embrace it. This is what America is supposed to be about. Having that opportunity, broadening the basis of democratic participation. And when I see the impact that he has had on these young Asian kids in my community, 3,000 miles away, uh, to me, uh, I think that it is despicable, shameless, and degenerate for those kinds of comments to be made about this kid and about this situation. I think what he has done is uh, uh, absolutely fabulous, and I hope that, it, I hope that he has a, a, a stellar run and a stellar year. But from my point of view, at this point, I, I, you know, it, I really don't care. We'll, we'll always have Paris. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, think y'all would probably suffer.